This talented tuba student plays very well. He breathes efficiently, has a strong sense of musicality, and has good flexibility. He also has an embouchure problem that has caused hurdles in his playing technique that he hasn't yet been able to overcome. Can you spot the problem? If you weren't able to spot the problem, we'll take another look at that player after a bit. First, I want to show you some embouchure characteristics that many teachers and players are unaware of and compare and contrast some different players. Using functioning embouchure patterns as a guide, it's possible to spot the actual cause of an embouchure difficulty and even correct troubles before they begin to cause real problems. Before I do so, however, I want to address a couple of common concerns. First, there is a widespread opinion that it is much better to focus on breathing than embouchure. Looking at the embouchure closely shouldn't imply that breathing is unimportant to good brass playing, it definitely is. Breathing is, however, much better understood by most teachers and therefore receives much more attention. I'm merely recommending we add another tool to our toolbox, not replace what's already effective. The other criticism I often get is that brass embouchures are too complex to consciously control and that trying to do so will lead to paralysis by analysis. I'll try to challenge this assumption here and show examples of where some conscious analysis and embouchure control can have a positive effect. I'll also show some cases where problems develop because of a lack of understanding of embouchure form and function. The last point I want to make before I begin my discussion of brass embouchures is that it's important for us to remember that musical expression is our goal. Instrumental technique is a means to a musical performance, and not the end in and of itself. There is a time and place for analysis, but also a separate time and place for focus on being a good musical communicator. When analyzing different players' embouchures, it's useful to look for similarities, but we should also consider the differences. Every person has unique anatomical features. The shape of a player's tooth structure obviously has an effect on the player's embouchure, but other features can also come into play in sometimes surprising ways. Some players have very wide lips and others are narrow. Some players have very thick lips and some are very thin. Some players have long upper lips in relation to their teeth, and others have very short upper lips. Some players have a lot of room on their upper lip or chin to place the mouthpiece where others find their nose or chin to get in the way. These, and other less obvious anatomical features, will have a sometimes unexpected effect on how an individual's embouchure functions. The first embouchure characteristic I will cover is the embouchure's airstream direction. Many brass musicians use terms upstream and downstream to refer to the player's horn angle. Use of a transparent mouthpiece will show that there are examples of downstream performers with a horn angle that is quite high and also tilted down, and likewise for upstream brass players. While a player's horn angle is an important part of their embouchure, it plays no role in the direction the airstream passes the lips into the mouthpiece. Downstream embouchure players place the mouthpiece with more upper lip than lower lip inside the cup. Because the upper lip predominates, the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup below the shank. The precise angle the airstream travels depends on the individual player and also the register being played. When a downstream player plays higher, the airstream will be blown at a sharper angle and the air will strike closer to the rim. As the player plays lower, the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup closer to the shank of the mouthpiece. When a player places the mouthpiece with more lower lip inside, the reverse situation happens. The lower lip will instead predominate, and the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup above the shank. 
opposite of downstream embouchures. When an upstream embouchure plays into the high register, the airstream will strike the cup even higher and strike closer to the shank when playing lower. Players who place the mouthpiece close to half and half always have one lip or another predominating, and the airstream will either get blown upstream or downstream, sometimes even flipping airstream direction. In spite of some musicians' descriptions of their playing sensations, there really aren't any brass players who blow straight down the shank of the mouthpiece. Placement off to one side or another is also not uncommon. The best mouthpiece placement for an individual is quite personal and should be based on what is comfortable and works efficiently, not on what looks most centered. The second embouchure characteristic that I'll discuss is what I'll be calling an embouchure motion in this presentation. Whether or not the musician is aware of it, all brass players will slide the lips along the teeth with the mouthpiece while changing registers. It's important to note that the placement of the mouthpiece on the lips don't change, but rather the mouthpiece and lips together get moved to a different relationship on the teeth behind them. Most brass players are unaware that they do this at all, yet all players seem to have an embouchure motion when you look closely enough. The direction of the embouchure motion is personal to the individual, but the general motion tends to be in an upward and downward direction. This trombonist has an embouchure motion to push up towards the nose to ascend and pull down towards the chin to descend. This trumpet player has a similar motion up to ascend and down to descend. Some players, however, do the opposite. This trumpet player pulls the lips and mouthpiece together down towards the chin to ascend and pushes up to descend. It's not uncommon for the track of the embouchure motion to be slightly to the side. My own embouchure motion is to pull down and to my left to ascend, and then push up and to the right to descend. When looking closely at a large number of brass players' embouchures, three basic patterns emerge. These three basic embouchure types don't represent a particular practice method, but are simply models that describe what can be seen with virtually every brass player. Before I go any further, I want to clarify that I feel the correct embouchure type is a factor of each individual player's unique anatomy, and really nothing else. There are examples of world-class brass players of all three embouchure types and in all fields of music, ranging from classical to jazz. Since each of these three basic embouchure types function differently, teachers will want to understand what constitutes good embouchure form for each of these three types. The first embouchure type I'll discuss is one of the more common ones. Because players of this downstream embouchure type place the mouthpiece quite high on the lips, with around 70% to 90% upper lip, this type can be nicknamed the very high placement type. These brass musicians will also push their mouthpiece and lips together up towards the nose to ascend, and pull down towards the chin to descend. These players almost always have their jaw positioned so that their teeth are more or less aligned, resulting in a horn angle, that is close to straight out. This trombonist has all of the typifying features of a very high placement embouchure type. His mouthpiece placement is high, with about 80% upper lip 
and is therefore downstream. As he descends, he pulls the mouthpiece and lips together down towards the chin, and pushes them up towards the nose to ascend. Like most other very high placement embouchure type players, his jaw is held in a protruded position, more or less aligning the teeth, and his horn angle is fairly high. If you watch this player closely from the front, you can see how each pitch seems to have its own slot on the track of his embouchure motion. When he slurs one octave back to the starting pitch, he brings his mouthpiece and lips back to the same position along his teeth. This trumpet player is also a good example of a very high placement embouchure type. His mouthpiece placement is pretty high on the lips, and his embouchure motion is also to push the mouthpiece and lips together up towards the nose to ascend and pull them down towards the chin to descend. His horn angle is a little lower than most very high placement embouchure types, but it doesn't appear to be working against his playing in any way. All players have unique differences in their embouchure form and function, even comparing players of the same embouchure type. Another interesting feature about this trumpet player is how he brings his horn angle slightly to our left to descend, and slightly to our right to ascend. Combined with the embouchure motion, many players will find that altering their horn angles when changing registers helps to maintain necessary rim and lip contact with the changing shape of their teeth and gums underneath. The best horn angles for a particular player are also influenced a great deal by the player's jaw manipulation as well. This horn player is an excellent example of a very high placement embouchure type as well. He places the mouthpiece with a great deal of upper lip inside the cup, and is definitely a downstream embouchure. His embouchure motion of pushing the mouthpiece and lips up to ascend and pulling them down to descend is easy to spot as well. It's not uncommon for players to have an embouchure motion that is at an angle. This horn player pushes his mouthpiece and lips up and to his right to ascend, and pulls them down into his left to descend. Very high placement tuba players need a lot of room on their upper lip for the mouthpiece, like this player. Players with smaller upper lips may find their nose to get in the way. Since the tuba is supported on the player's lap, tubists will make the embouchure motion through adjusting the position of their bodies and instrument. Notice that this tubist still pushes the mouthpiece and lips together up to ascend, and pulls them down to descend. He also lets his mouth corners collapse almost every time he descends. It's better to keep the mouth corners firm in all registers. Each embouchure type has some common tendencies, although it is easy to find exceptions. Generally speaking, very high placement type players tend to have an easy time developing their upper register, but sometimes difficulties opening up the sound and flexibility in their lower range. Their tone can often be described as bright and clear. Many very high placement players play better on deeper cup mouthpieces. Low brass players of this embouchure type may need smaller rims if they find their nose gets in the way of their ascending embouchure motion. The next embouchure type I'll discuss places the mouthpiece with usually around just over 50% to 70% upper lip inside the mouthpiece cup, and can be nicknamed the medium-high placement embouchure type. This embouchure type is similar to the very high placement type, in that there is more upper lip inside the mouthpiece and is a downstream embouchure. Players of this embouchure type typically have a receded jaw position and a horn angle that is tilted down a bit more than very high placement types, but there are exceptions. The most important distinguishing difference 
is that the medium-high placement embouchure type will always pull the mouthpiece and lips down to ascend and push them up to descend, opposite of the very high placement type. This trumpet player places the mouthpiece with a little more upper lip than lower lip inside the cup, so the airstream still gets blown down. He is also typical of the medium-high placement embouchure type in that his lower jaw is slightly receded and his horn angle is tilted down slightly. His ascending embouchure motion is to pull the mouthpiece and lips together down towards the chin to ascend and push them up towards the nose to descend. The view from the front shows a large amount of side-to-side -side deviation in his embouchure motion. His ascending embouchure motion is to not only pull the mouthpiece down, but also to his right. He does the opposite to descend, pushing the mouthpiece and lips together up and to his left. This next trumpet player is also a medium-high placement embouchure type. This player's mouthpiece placement is a little higher on the lips, and his horn angle is closer to straight out, so he might look more like a very high placement embouchure, except that his embouchure motion is clearly to pull the mouthpiece and lips together down to ascend and push them up to descend. This player's embouchure motion shows consistency in both the amount of motion between octaves and the direction of the track of his embouchure motion. This is remarkable not only for providing an excellent model to emulate, but also because this player was completely unaware that he was making this motion in the first place. He was surprised when he viewed this video and I pointed it out to him. This next example of a medium-high placement embouchure type is a brass doubler. Watching him play bass trumpet here makes it difficult to tell in the lower register whether he is upstream or downstream. But when he ascends into the upper register, the lip position clearly shows him blowing downstream. His embouchure motion is down to ascend and up to descend, so he fits the medium-high placement embouchure type. Medium-high placement players who place the mouthpiece close to half and half need to be careful that they don't slide the mouthpiece to a lower placement on the lips as they ascend and accidentally switch to an upstream embouchure. On trumpet, his downstream embouchure is a little easier to spot. Looking closely, you can see how the angle of the airstream becomes even further downstream as he ascends and strikes closer to the throat of the mouthpiece as he plays lower. He raises and lowers his horn angle along with the embouchure motion. As he ascends and pulls the mouthpiece and lips down, his bell comes up a little, and he does the reverse to descend. This medium-high placement example is a very powerful player, particularly on trumpet, his primary instrument. Medium-high placement players tend to have a darker timbre than the very high placement players. Sometimes players of this embouchure type set their embouchure formation a little too loose in order to go after this big and dark sound, and struggle with their upper register because of it. Low range and flexibility are also typically easier for the medium-high placement type embouchure. The last basic embouchure type is characterized by a mouthpiece placement low enough that the lower lip predominates anywhere from just over 50% lower lip to as much as 90% lower lip inside the mouthpiece. Because this embouchure type places the mouthpiece with so much lower lip inside, the embouchure is upstream and it can be nicknamed the low placement embouchure type. The embouchure motion for the low placement type is almost always to pull the lips and teeth downward towards the chin to ascend and push them up towards the nose to descend. The horn angle for this type can be in any direction, but it is very common to find players with a horn angle close to straight out. Players who have the anatomy that makes this embouchure type work best for them are more rare than the downstream types, 
but are still a sizable minority of brass players. This trumpet player is a good example of a low-placement embouchure type. His mouthpiece placement is quite low on the lips, with the upper rim in contact with his upper lip. Because of the predominance of lower lip inside the mouthpiece, the airstream is blown up. This low placement embouchure type example has the more common straight out horn angle for upstream players. His embouchure motion of pulling the mouthpiece and lips together down to ascend and up to descend is easily seen. This next trumpet player is also a good example of the low placement embouchure type. His mouthpiece placement is also right on the red of his upper lip. His embouchure motion of pulling the mouthpiece and lips together down to ascend and pushing them up to descend is also easy to spot. For certain individuals, such as this trumpet player, their anatomy makes this very low mouthpiece placement the most efficient place to put the mouthpiece. This player has the range and power typical for upstream embouchures when they function properly. His embouchure motion has some angular deviation. He pulls down into his right to ascend and pushes up into his left to descend. This player is a good example of the low placement embouchure type on French horn. Her mouthpiece placement is fairly low and is definitely upstream. Her embouchure motion of pulling the mouthpiece and lips together down to ascend and up to descend is also very easy to spot. She also has a common low placement type problem. She brings her mouth corners back into a smile to ascend. Stretching the lips like this causes problems including difficulties with endurance and a high range cap. Regardless of the player's embouchure type, it is best to keep the mouth corners locked in place for the entire range. Low placement embouchure type tuba players need to have a long enough and flat enough chin to accommodate the low mouthpiece placement. Some players may find their chin to get in the way. Because of the large size of the tuba mouthpiece, it's easy to view how the angle of the airstream changes according to the register being played with this player. Looking closely, you will see this player blowing the airstream at a higher angle as he ascends and blowing the airstream closer towards the shank as he descends. This player's embouchure motion is easier to spot from the front. He also has some side-to-side -side deviation in its direction. He pulls the mouthpiece and lips together down and to his right to ascend, and pushes them up and to his left to descend. Low placement type brass musicians often find their upper register to be quite easy, although they sometimes find it difficult to play in the low register. Their tone quality is usually pretty bright, and many low placement players who want a darker sound choose bigger equipment to help. This embouchure type is a little more sensitive than the downstream types. When things are working correctly, playing can feel quite effortless, but when it's a little bit off, it can be a nightmare. Before I go any further, I have to go off on a tangent for a moment about the very low placement type embouchure which has been incorrectly discouraged by a huge number of brass teachers, including several famous ones. They assume that because they are incapable of playing with this embouchure, and have success with another, that this holds true for all students. When they instruct a low placement type player as a downstream type, they are inadvertently setting up a situation that tends to lead towards the downward spiral I just mentioned. Unfortunately, many of these teachers then see this as further evidence that this embouchure type is wrong. Out of players who seek me out specifically for embouchure troubleshooting, the single most common problem is that a teacher told a low placement type player to move his or her mouthpiece placement up to a higher placement on the lips. 
Rather than move the mouthpiece placement, teachers will want to instruct students with this embouchure type by helping them work with, not against, their anatomy. While this next example is an extreme case of this situation, it does show how potentially destructive it can be to force a student to play with an embouchure type that doesn't suit the student's anatomical structure. When this trumpet student began lessons with a new teacher, she immediately asked him to move his mouthpiece placement off his upper lip. About a year later, he developed an uncontrollable tremor in his embouchure formation. He sought the help of someone reputed to help with this sort of difficulty, who recommended he start blowing even before placing the mouthpiece, resulting in this distinctive embouchure setting. Looking on a transparent mouthpiece, it's difficult to see if he's normally playing as a downstream or upstream embouchure because his placement is so close to half and half, and he sets his lips in a slightly rolled out position. Moving his mouthpiece higher on the lips makes his tremor worse, but moving the placement so that his embouchure functions as a low placement type seems to help. When I asked him to show me how he played before he moved his mouthpiece higher, he plays as a low placement type and the tremors temporarily disappear. I was unable to work with this student for more than one short session, but I believe that his problems were both caused and exacerbated by well-intentioned, but ultimately ignorant advice. My suggestion for this student after the single brief session I got to work with him was to work on strengthening his embouchure formation, set the mouthpiece with the lips already in position, and let his mouthpiece placement go back to where it was before. While many brass embouchure issues are personal in nature, there is some basic advice that will apply for most players. It's important to understand that the recommendations I am about to give are only intended for players to concern themselves about in the practice room or during their warm-up period. The exact exercises that are used are less important than how the exercises are played. Working with beginning brass students offers a particular challenge to teachers. Ultimately, I've found that when left up to their own experimentation, most beginners will naturally gravitate to the embouchure type appropriate for their anatomy. Since some students may come across different information, or try to reason out where to place the mouthpiece, it may be helpful to actively encourage beginners to allow their placement to move where it wants to. Beyond that, Helping beginners with their embouchure should mainly be focused on avoiding bad habits. Until a student has been playing a while and developed a certain amount of embouchure strength and control, it can be difficult to determine which embouchure type will ultimately work best for the student. Younger students who are still growing or with braces may correctly evolve from one embouchure type to another. Encouraging good posture and holding the instrument correctly and consistently will also help with students' embouchures. The left hand on trumpet and trombone should be responsible for supporting the entire weight of the instrument, as well as making the embouchure motion. Horn players who rest the bell on the lap may find that it locks the angle of the instrument lower than it should be. Euphonium and tuba players often must compromise slightly between adjusting their bodies and the angle of the instrument, but will want to work towards bringing the instrument to the lips, not their lips to the instrument. I also personally feel that a lot of popular methods for beginners start off in too low a range. While it may be easier for a beginner to get the initial sound on a low note, it's much easier to get a sound with incorrect technique while playing lower. Since we want to encourage good embouchure form as quickly as possible, 
Beginning students will be less likely to play with a collapsed embouchure formation if they start by learning to play around the third open partial. You will want to build in some brief rest periods while they are building endurance because it is a bit more taxing to play higher. Many players allow their mouthpiece placement to drift around onto different spots on their lips. Or they open their mouth to inhale and must constantly adjust to the shifting position of the mouthpiece on their lower lip after every breath. Other players set the mouthpiece first, then firm their lips underneath, twisting around their lips inside the mouthpiece. In order to encourage a stable embouchure formation, I recommend spending some practice time firming the lips into position, then placing the mouthpiece on the lips only after the embouchure formation is already set. When breathing, it is important to try to maintain the embouchure position as much as possible. Breathing through the nose is a good way to start off and get familiar with this sensation. Once that becomes comfortable, the player can start inhaling through the mouth corners while keeping the lips inside the mouthpiece lightly touching. This may feel a little strange at first, but over time it should help players perform with more consistency. Around the turn of the last century, it was common practice to pull the mouth corners back, as if smiling, to ascend. This works to a degree, because it stretches the tissue of the lips tighter and does aid with faster vibrations. The trade-off, however, is that because the lips are stretched thinner, they are more sensitive to mouthpiece pressure and endurance issues. The tone quality also suffers and typically these players end up with a range cap around where they can no longer pull their corners back further. Today, it is widely acknowledged that a smile embouchure is something to be avoided. Playing in the low register requires a brass musician to have a larger embouchure aperture and more surface area of the lips must vibrate. Allowing the embouchure formation to collapse and become too loose will actually help a player play in the low register, but it can lead to some issues, including having to reset the mouthpiece on the lips to ascend back up. Very high placement and low placement embouchure types both are more prone to this problem as players of these types often find the lip compression for the high register to be comparatively easy, but struggle more in the low register. Often, exaggerating the embouchure motion while locking the mouth corners in place can help these players learn how to descend with embouchure compression. The exaggerated motion can be reduced as soon as the player is able. In both cases of the smile embouchure and collapsing embouchure formation to descend, simply trying to keep the mouth corners locked in place often will not be enough to ultimately correct the issue. Free buzzing can help strengthen the muscle group that intersects just under the corners of the mouth. Because it requires more strength to free buzz, and it also completely avoids the risk of excessive mouthpiece pressure, I think of free buzzing as analogous to weight training for athletes. It is a safe and effective way to build muscular strength, which will translate to better embouchure control when actually playing. Because free buzzing is functionally different from a playing embouchure, it's really not useful to use free buzzing as a diagnostic tool. Regardless of the player's embouchure type, free buzzing is most effective when done with the lips in a downstream position. At first, students may need to roll their lower lip slightly in and over their lower teeth to even get a buzz. As they develop strength, their lower lip will move out on its own. In order to really target the proper muscles, Students should buzz softer and in a higher register, striving for a tone that might be described as a mosquito-like buzz. One easy free buzzing exercise is to simply buzz the highest pitch you can for the full extent of your breath 
three times. You can also practice mouth corner inhalations at the same time by putting your finger over the center of your lips and breathing only through the corners. If that becomes easy, you can simply hold the lips into position without using your finger. Free buzzing is a safe but strenuous workout for the embouchure muscles, so a little bit goes a long way. I recommend separating this exercise from normal playing by at least 20 minutes or so. Doing this exercise once a day is enough for most players at first. Downstream players will sometimes find buzzing into the instrument is a great way to help them find their correct embouchure form. Some downstream players don't respond well to this sort of practice though, especially if they struggle with free buzzing to start with. Upstream players will want to avoid buzzing into the instrument because their embouchure form is very different from buzzing to playing. Even though most players are completely unaware of their embouchure motion, it is a very important part of a player's technique. When working efficiently and in conjunction with proper muscular strength and control, the embouchure motion aids the amount of lip compression and also helps line up the embouchure aperture properly with the airstream. When the embouchure motion is too large, too small, or moving along in the wrong direction for the player, problems can begin to manifest. For the player unaware of his embouchure motion in the first place, these issues can be quite frustrating to troubleshoot as they often don't appear until later and the cause and effect relationship between their embouchure motion and the problem is obscured. While exceptions may exist, as a general rule of thumb, the amount of embouchure motion used to ascend a particular interval, such as an octave, should be the same amount of embouchure motion used to descend the same interval from the same starting pitch. This is also true for any accompanying horn angle changes when appropriate for the particular player. The embouchure motion should move along in an imaginary track in a straight line and not hook off in a different direction. This very high placement type trombonist has a common problem with his embouchure motion. In the extreme ranges, both high and low, many players overdo the amount of motion they need. Watch as he ascends back up from the low octaves and note how much more motion he uses to get up to the middle octaves compared with ascending to the high octaves. Now watch as he plays down into the pedal range. His embouchure motion is already so far in the descending direction that when he goes down for the pedal B-flat, he pulls down too far and misses the note entirely. My own embouchure motion has a similar issue. In my case, I go too far in my descending embouchure motion for the low B-flat, so I end up coming back in the opposite direction to descend to the pedal B-flat. This reversal of embouchure form makes it more challenging for me in this low register. When I consciously work on minimizing my descending motion, I'm better able to put the low B-flat where it should be, and my descending embouchure motion is more consistent from low B-flat to pedal B-flat. This trumpet player has an embouchure motion reversal that causes more serious difficulties. He plays with a downstream embouchure, with more upper lip inside the mouthpiece. Watching him play these low register slurs makes him look like a very high placement type, as he seems to be pushing the mouthpiece and lips up to ascend and pulling them down to descend. When he goes into the upper register, however, he reverses this motion, pulling down to ascend and making him look like a medium high placement type. His embouchure formation is a little bit too loose, and he collapses his mouth corners to descend, which makes it more challenging to determine which type will work better. By asking him to hold a pitch as steadily as possible while I push and pull his mouthpiece and lips up and down, we can hear that pulling down makes the pitch go sharp, and pushing up makes the pitch go flat, which makes me suspect he should be playing as a medium-high placement type. With some practice firming up his embouchure formation, 
It could become more apparent which embouchure type will be more appropriate for this player's anatomy, and he will then benefit from making his embouchure motion work consistently the same in all registers. This very high placement trumpet player has some angular deviation to the direction of his embouchure motion. What is difficult to spot with the camera at this particular angle is that while he pushes up into his right to ascend, his descending embouchure motion hooks back towards the right. As he plays longer, this causes him to work harder and he gets tired quickly. Moving his mouthpiece and lips for him while he holds pitches in various ranges offers clues as to the specific track of his embouchure motion. Listen to how the pitch drops or raises while moving the mouthpiece and lips up, down, and to either side. By correcting the embouchure motion and making it work in a straight line, his playing shows almost immediate improvement and feels easier. In addition to the embouchure motion, many players will also alter their horn angle according to the register being played. Because most players' teeth and gums are curved, angular deviations in the direction of the embouchure motion can affect the best horn angle for a particular pitch. The way the jaw is manipulated when changing registers will also have an effect on the horn angle. Just like the amount of embouchure motion, angle changes seem to work best when they are consistent in the amount between intervals. Looking again at this medium-high placement trumpet player shows that he pulls down and to his right to ascend, and pushes up and to his left to descend. His jaw also protrudes slightly and moves to his left while ascending and does the reverse to descend. His horn angle is fairly static though, and the high C's sound a little pinched and flat. I asked him to try putting a little more mouthpiece weight on one side or another as he changed registers to see what happened. Moving the horn angle towards his left side while ascending still makes the high C sound flat. Moving the horn angle towards his right brings the high C more in tune. Doing the reverse angle changes while descending to low C are even more obvious. Bringing his angle to his left to descend opens the low C up where bringing the horn angle to his right to descend chokes off the note. Let's take another look at this tuba player from the beginning of my presentation. See if you can spot the cause of his difficulties. If you still didn't spot it, let's take a look at him playing some octave slurs and note his airstream direction. On the middle C, it is a little tough to see where the airstream is going, but on the high C it becomes clear that he's blowing the airstream down. When he slurs down to low C, however, his lips flip position and he switches to an upstream player. He makes this switch from upstream to downstream about the same range every time, around his middle C. When he plays this etude, you'll be able to see his lips fighting for predominance in this range, and here he almost always cracks the note when this happens. When confronted with students who have this sort of problem, many teachers recommend correcting the treble pitch by practicing exercises that approach it from above and below. While good intentioned, you can see how this sort of practice only exacerbates his issue.
he also struggles with his upper register. The high notes he can play are pretty solid, but just above he can't manage to squeeze out any more notes, not even with a soft and thin sound. He volunteered to show me a trick embouchure he discovered on his own that allows him to play higher, but he told me his teacher had discouraged him from using it, and that if he just kept practicing with the more centered mouthpiece placement, his muscles would develop and his high range would improve. When a player's embouchure type is correct for his or her anatomy, this may be true, but not in cases where the player is using the wrong embouchure type for his face. A little experimentation of moving his mouthpiece placement to a low placement embouchure type shows a lot of promise. He can not only play higher this way, but with his entire range now upstream, he has no embouchure type reversal and his break is gone. One more of those. Before I finish, I want to give you a brief summary of the embouchure types once again. Remember that these embouchure types aren't choices to be made by individual players or teachers, but are based on which type works best for the particular player's unique anatomy. In and of itself, no one type is better or worse than the others, as long as it is the correct embouchure type for the individual. The very high placement type is characterized by a mouthpiece placement that has 70% to 90% upper lip inside the mouthpiece and is downstream. These players always push the mouthpiece and lips together up towards the nose to ascend and pull them down towards the chin to descend. They usually play with their teeth aligned and a horn angle close to straight out. This embouchure type is very common. The medium-high placement embouchure type is also downstream, but they tend to place less upper lip inside the mouthpiece, around 50% to 70% upper lip. These players always pull the mouthpiece and lips together down to ascend and push them up to descend. It's more common for these players to have a receded jaw position and a horn angle slightly down. This embouchure type is also very common. The low placement embouchure type is the only one that places less upper lip than lower lip inside the mouthpiece, around 50% to 90% lower lip inside, making it an upstream embouchure. These players will almost always pull down to ascend and push up to descend. The horn angle and teeth position for this type shows more variation than the downstream types. This embouchure type is more rare than the other types, partly because fewer individuals have the anatomy that makes this embouchure work, and partly because so many downstream teachers don't understand this type and change all their students to downstream types. For students who are truly low placement types, this never works as well, and even can cause a complete breakdown in their playing abilities. Thank you for taking the time to watch my presentation. I hope that it has taken some of the mystery out of brass embouchures for you, and will give you some useful tools for further exploration. If you are interested in learning more, I suggest books by Donald Reinhardt, who was perhaps the first author to make embouchure types an important part of his pedagogy. Since Reinhardt's terms are easily confused, I've chosen to use simplified nomenclature developed by Doug Elliott, a former student of Reinhardt's. Ultimately, it doesn't matter what we call these embouchure characteristics, as long as we recognize that there is no such thing as a single proper brass embouchure. A widespread understanding of this offers exciting possibilities for brass playing and pedagogy. Collectively, we are smarter than any individual, so I'd like to urge you to take some time to look closely at brass players around you and share what you discover. Always remember that our goal is to make music. It's good to spend time daily forgetting all about technique and just play.